Hey everybody, this is John Buck back with another array signal processing video. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about the basics of time domain delay in sum beamforming. This is pretty much the most direct, simplest, and oldest version of, of beamforming or spatial filtering to emphasize signals from one direction while attenuating those from others. Uh, this video does is uh, assumes that you've watched the two previous videos on plane waves and uniform line array. It's the third video in the series. So if you haven't seen the one on the conceptual overview or deriving the delays for the received signal, you need to pause this and go back and watch those so that you can understand what we're going to do in this video where we say, well, once we've uh, observed or measured these signals, what do we do to go ahead processing them further? All right, so with that, we'll go on to the, uh, the whiteboard and, and talk in detail. So again, we're, this is the time domain delay in some beam forming. And we're going to assume we've observed some time domain signal f of t for n sensors, capital N sensors, that go from n equals 0, 1, up to n minus 1 in the uniform linear array like we talked about in the previous video. Right, so just to remind you, right, the video looks like this, where the sensors are spaced by d along the z-axis, uh, and we index them from n equals 0 at the bottom <clears throat> to n equals 1, so that n increases, increases with increasing z along the axis. Uh, and we often assume that we're going to have an odd number of sensors with the zero, uh, the middle sensor lined up at z equals 0. So we derived in the previous video the delays we get for that. So let's write our expression for f of n, right, so that the signal observed at the nth sensor, little nth sensor, is some propagating signal f of t where it's been delayed by an amount tau sub n of theta. So the delay depends on theta and the sensor, and we derived for uh, tau in the previous video. Right, so this delay depends on the separation between the sensors, the cosine of the angle relative to the positive z-axis for the incoming plane wave, and for the speed of sound c. And we also reference it to the phase center element n sub c. <clears throat> right, so that's the one that always gets zero delay when little n equals n sub c. Right, so now we want to take all these sensors, and again, as we talked about in the first class, the goal of beamforming is to figure out how to combine them, and we're going to start with the simple uh, linear beamformer, so we're going to apply a gain to each channel and a delay. So let's write out the equation for the output of our beamformer in terms of the sensors. Right, so we're going to take a weighted average, or weighted sum of the different sensors each of which has some gain g sub n applied to it, and also has some time shift delta of n. Well, this, should, this should be a little t here. Let me fix that. Right? And then it's been delayed, or shifted at least, but we'll see it's often advanced, by some delta sub n for the nth sensor, which is a function of theta naught, the look angle. Right? The direction we're trying to look in, that is, create constructive interference. Okay, so you can see why this is, is called the delay in some beamformers, that each, each observed signal is being delayed, and then we, we sum them all together, possibly with some weights g of n. All right, though, for today, to keep things simple, oh, and I should mention the shift we use is the same formula we had uh, for the delay in the previous video. So we say, assuming the signal came from our look direction theta naught, what would be the delay? We'll use that for our delta. With one critical difference, actually, rather than delay, we would we would often I'm sorry, this should be written like a plus that we're shifting we're we're shifting the same amount but in the other direction to compensate for this. So if we use the same expression here, this will be plus delta of n for our shift. Right, and then for the for today we're going to keep it simple. Imagine that the gain is the same on all the channels, so we're just effectively averaging them. We're going to take all these channels and average them together after we've shifted them, hopefully to create constructive interference for anything coming from the theta naught direction. Okay, so we can pull this g of n, 1 over n out front here and write this sum. And we're also then going to plug in uh, the expression we had for f of n up above here. Right, that's uh, this expression here. And let's see what that gives us for our beamformer. Right, so when we put it this way, we pull the 1 over n out front. Now we have this sum. All the f of n's get referenced to f, our propagating wavefront, our, our propagating signal. 
we've got t minus tau sub n plus delta sub n of theta naught. And so this form makes it really clear that if theta equals theta naught, so that delta n equals tau n, they're just going to cancel each other out for each of the sensors, and we'll be left with the original signal. So if we assume that our, our sum becomes this expression here, and we're just left with n copies of f times 1 over n, right? So evaluating the inside the sum gives us this n f of t, and it cancels the 1 over n, and the beamformer output y equals f of t, which is what we want, right? If That says if the signal propagation direction theta really is the direction we're looking, theta naught, this is what the constructive interference looks like in the time domain to give us our original signal back. But if they're not, we could end up with, with the difference between these. And then we're left still with the difference of them. We can simplify a little bit if we want, right? So that we get the sum, but they all have uh, different, oh, and there's an n missing here too, right? We can write it like this, but it doesn't provide us with a whole lot more insight other than to see where we have this difference of the cosine between the actual propagation direction theta and the look direction theta naught. But it's pretty clear, in general, these are not going to line up well. And in fact, they may even be destructive, like that example we saw in the conceptual overview, where the waveforms have been shifted the wrong way so that they actually the peaks and valleys will be aligned when I take the, air, the sum across sensors and create destructive interference. So trying to understand what happens here, we say, well, how is this, you know, how strong, what will come out? Will it be close to n or not? You know, will we get, will we get, these, these versions of f, will they add up well or not? And, and it's hard to look at this time domain expression and say. And so one of the, you know, the underlying lessons we should have learned in our linear systems class, or signals and systems, is that when the going gets tough in the time domain, the smart money moves to the frequency domain. So we could think about taking this to the frequency domain, maybe even going back to the original equation and saying, well, what would happen if I took the Fourier transform of this whole equation here? Right, I've got a linear things here and the Fourier transform is linear. And then I have delay properties or shift properties here. And I can write everything in terms of that. So let's uh, start on a new page and do that. So we get this equation where I've just regrouped things a little bit to put the, the delay as a common delay, which is tau minus delta n. And so if I took the Fourier transform of each side, on the left-hand side, I get y of omega. And on the right-hand side, using the linearity property, I still have 1 over n, and I still have the sum of the Fourier transform of these delayed terms. So pause and think for a minute if you don't remember right away from undergraduate linear systems. If I delay in time, what's happening in the Fourier transform? I'll pause the video and think for a minute. Right, so it's a multiply by a complex exponential and frequency. So all these terms just have an f of omega with a different phase. Right, so using our usual Fourier transform properties, all these are f of omega times an e to the minus j omega times the time shift. Right, This overall thing is the time shift. And I'll say, well, that f of omega doesn't depend on the sensor. The Fourier transform is the same as I go from sensor to sensor. It's just the phase that's shifting. So I can pull that out front. Right, Looking like this, and again, this how, do, how we sum this, well, it depends. We, we need to bring out the n from inside these terms. So we can do that along as we did in the previous slide with the d over c and cosine. So let's do that. Okay, so by substituting for tau n and delta n and then pulling out the common terms up front, I get this, but it still comes down to the difference of the cosines, or we could write this as u minus u naught using the directional cosine. Like this, where again u naught, you know, u is cosine theta and u naught is cosine theta naught. And we're not going to pursue this all the way through now. We will soon, next time we'll look at this, but it does tell us that the answer depend, you know, lets us see what the answer depends on, right? Besides cosine theta and, and cosine of theta naught, the, look direct, the difference between the look direction and the actual propagation direction, the answer depends on frequency, right? What the gain of this thing is when I do this sum, in fact, if we look carefully, and we'll see in detail in a future class, probably next time, that this is the finite geometric sum with just a lot of baggage around it, but the same one we saw a lot in discrete time linear systems. And with some change of variables and substitutions, we'll quickly see that these this turns into expressions we're familiar with, uh, but that how much gain we get 
for a plane wave that's propagating from a different direction than the one we're looking, theta naught, will be a function of not only d and c, but also, and the difference between these two cosines, but also frequency. So it will be frequency dependent. So I'm going to stop here. This is the, the big picture. I guess other than to mention again, this makes it clear when cos theta equals cos theta naught, right, these two terms in the exponent cancel out. This becomes zero. And so the whole sum is e to the zero, which is one. And I get my n terms to cancel the one over n. So that's the constructive interference version of the, uh, the, the frequency domain version of constructive interference. But again, the main idea for the delay in sum, or it's sometimes called the conventional beam former, right? So it's the conventional beam former because it's sort of the most basic original one, whether you implement it in time or frequency. I guess one last closing comment is, is some people might look at this and say, well, John, this is you know, all great in theory, but if I'm building a real-time beam former, I can't shift things backwards in time with plus. And when we do this in practice, in that case, they're often, well, the two, two responses worth thinking about that is if you're working on a system that's recording data, even if it's into a buffer, so it's close to real time, but not truly continuous time real time, where you're sampling a, with an, a bunch of A to Ds, you're sampling your data into a buffer, you may be able to effectively do that with just the small latency of your buffer, right? Some, quote, real time systems are close to real time, but are still using buffered data, so it is possible. Or another way to think of it is what really matters is the relative delays and that we might have a bulk delay. So we might actually be, um, in fact, delaying all this in, in practice, delaying all the f of n's by some amount, uh, capital T bulk minus the delta n. Right. So rather than this exact expression, practically, we would have something like that would, the f of n's would become f of n of t minus some capital T bulk that is large enough, t bulk is bigger than the most, the largest value of delta of n. And so the net of this would be t plus delta minus t bulk, keeping everything causal, because what really matters is the relative delays of the channel, assuming we're going to have some overall, and then all the copies of the signal we get will be delayed by t bulk, which is sort of just the fixed latency needed to keep all the system causal. And we can come back to that. That's a practical issue. If it doesn't bother you, or if you weren't, weren't wondering about it, you don't need to worry about it here. You can just live with now for the idea of that effectively we're moving things, at, at, we're shifting things to the left by saying plus delta n, maybe because it's offline or slightly offline in, in, a, in a buffered data system. But there is a, you know, I, I just, just wanted to mention for completeness or for to avoid maybe people being confused in the comments about this. All right, so I'll stop here and load this up. This will cover our basics for time domain. Uh, and I'll, we'll, again, do some class problems uh, digging into this deeper when we meet for class this week. See you then.